Hi, welcome to the second episode of Innovation Through Autodesk Simulation. My name's Dave May. And I'm Brian Zeiss. So we left off last time with static loading and making sure that our structural factor of safety, our yield factor of safety was below three, and our displacement was less than a tenth of an inch. But what we have to realize, and again reviewing the video of these robot arms, we're in a dynamic situation, meaning that it's, it's not going to be completely acceptable to assume that all of these forces on the system are time invariant or static. Right. Now, when it comes to dynamic loads, I mean, really, what are they and why are they so important? Great question. To do that, we've put together a little illustration. Let's apply a known mass to the end of this bar and see exactly how much displacement we get. And we're letting this weight go gently. So we can call this a static load because we're applying it slowly. We're not letting the system accelerate at all. Now, let's take a look at this same load applied more abruptly where we actually are going to place it just on top and then release it. Wow, that's a big difference. You can see that the response is not just a single displacement, but it actually fluctuates back and forth. And if we actually look at the displacement here, you notice it's more than in the static sense. Sure. So one of the main assumptions we made in linear static analysis was that the inertial terms didn't matter, or basically the acceleration of the load had no impact on the system. We're only solving for the stiffness. Right. Why don't we go ahead and take a look at the frame and apply one of those reaction loads? So let's go ahead, right-click on the study type, choose transient stress. And notice there's two types, direct integration and modal superposition. We'll talk about the difference later on, but let's start off with direct integration. And when we talk about transient stress, this is a type of linear dynamic system. So some assumptions from linear statics still hold, such as it's a linear system. The materials still have to be linear. Right. So that means, what if we have permanent deformation? So if we're going to drop this weight on it or have this flexing happen in a brief period of time, what if it goes beyond the yield point? We're not going to be able to take that into account mm. with linear dynamics. That's when we have to get into MES and do a nonlinear study. We copy our current study, which means we can leverage our mesh, leverage our material setup, and it gives us a good basis for setting up the new transient stress problem. Now, what if I want to go back and look at my static results? Am I going to lose those by doing this? No. What we've set up here is a new design scenario. So each time we create a new study, you can see on my part tree, it creates a new design scenario. And the best practice is to rename these. We're still going to have the lumped mass 2,000 uh, pounds on the end. That's right. still there. In addition to that, though, we're going to apply a reaction torque at the center of gravity to represent the robotic arm jerking. First of all, select the node to which we want to apply the force. And that means we've got to go up to our selection toolbar, hit the point select, and hit the select vertices tool. Right. Uh, yep, that allows me to go in, select the end point where my remote load is, right click, and let's go ahead and add a nodal force. We're going to go ahead and set up this nodal force with curve one. And we're going to make this uh, load curve be what we call always on. Right? So this means the multiplier doesn't do anything fancy. We just want this load to be on all the time. Right? The reason for that is because we're actually going to be set, setting up this first one to represent the weight of our robotic arm. So now wait, what's a load curve though? Because in the static sense, all I had to do was apply 2,000 pounds to the structure. Well, a load curve in a transient analysis is required to let the processor know when this load's active and when it isn't. Also, you can change multipliers. So you can have this load ramp up over time mm. or be applied kind of instantaneously. Okay, so I'm still going to apply 2,000 pounds and a 500 inch pound moment, but I want to apply them differently over time. Exactly. Now, we set up the load curves inside our analysis parameters. So what we're going to do here is set up the nodal force representing the 2,000 pounds down, and then we're also going to set up a nodal moment representing the 500 inch pound force. But right now, we haven't defined the load curve, so it doesn't know how it changes over time. Let's go into our analysis parameters, into our load curves, and actually define out curves one and two. So curve one is the dead load, so I'm just going to set that to be zero, one, and then one second, one. So it's, like Dave said, a constant amplitude of one times the 2,000 pounds. Right. Now we're only looking at this over one second. Um, if you have something that you expect to be, you know, a very large system that maybe is going to have 
a longer period of time that you need to look at the response for, you could use a higher value for that as well. But a second for this system is going to be plenty of time. That's right, because in fact, if we set up load curve 2, which controls the reaction torque, we know from our controls guy that it's roughly a 20 millisecond impulse that the robot acts at, and it's going to peak out at about 10 thousandths of a second. So we can quickly insert the data points here and create that impulse. So that's pretty fast. I mean, we're peaking out at 10 thousandths of a second. So back in my analysis parameters, there's a very, very critical option here where I have to set up the time step because now that we're solving, not in one step like linear static, but as many steps as we need or want. So how do we know what the time step should be? So since we have an impulse that has, you know, uh, a hundredth of a second mm -hmm. for its duration, we're going to want to make sure we have at least 10 steps over that time period. So we'll do a thousandth of a second. Exactly. Now, kind of like meshing, right, there's a trade-off between the more time steps we have and the more solution time. So sure. each time step that I want to see results for, which is what I'm asking it right here, I'm asking for, you know, 100 steps, that's 100 times it has to solve the problem and, and iterate the solution. So uh, it's important to capture the event of the impulse, but it's also important not to go overboard and ask for 10,000. So let's jump to the results. And since this is dynamic, we want to look at this over time. So the best way to do that is to visualize with an animation. Uh, first of all, again, look at displacements. Absolutely, displacements. Let's go ahead and animate the displacement. And we can see right away what the transient response looks like. When the impulse is applied, we can see it reaches a peak value and then kind of goes back and forth and oscillates until the one second time ends. We can also step through the different time steps using the arrows up here on the top left. Sure. Another way to do that is by using the page up or page down keys on your keyboard. Nice. Pro tip. Or uh, presentation remote also works. That's true. If you want to step through time with, with a uh, group of engineers. What's really neat here is that if you look in the bottom left, you see the peak value and the current time that you're at. And if we step through time, we see that the peak response is about 0 0.016 seconds. Yep. Now, Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to find that peak value. In this case, we kind of had an idea. You know, we knew when our impulse was happening, we assumed it would be slightly after that. Mm -hmm. But another way to do it is if you can tell where your structure's moving the most, Which at we, least you know you right. kind of where the corner is or right. the top, something like that. We know the top of the frame is right. It's bending down. Exactly. That's where we're going to have our highest motion. You can pick that point by choosing point select and mm -hmm. select vertices. You can choose that node, right click, and say graph values. So we see the amplitude here reaches up its maximum at 0 0.016 and kind of oscillates up and down. And even after the load is removed, the transient response is that it tends to go up and down and back and forth until it reaches equilibrium. Right. That's, again, this is why we call it a transient analysis. Right, because this type of behavior is time dependent. There's no way to capture this in the static sense. Right. Now notice how this amplitude actually decreases a little bit over time. This is because you're losing energy in the system, which is called damping, to those of you who aren't familiar with it. So if I wanted to take damping into account, though, I noticed in the analysis parameters there was an alpha and beta damping coefficient. Right. You can estimate those using several different techniques. Uh, we chose some values used in a white paper. Um, and those are representing basically Raleigh damping coefficients. And those are typically determined from experiment of similar system. Let's flip over to our Vamesis stress and see what that looks like. Let's go ahead and set this to factor of safety like we did before. Set our display options between 3 and 5. Right, just to be consistent with the plots we used from our static analysis. Absolutely, and now notice in the dynamic sense with that reaction torque applied, we actually have some red hot spots. Oh yeah. Definitely. And I'll notice where some of these are. These are in locations where we did have hot spots before when we were going through our different design iterations. We see that the response is almost always amplified when the load right. is fast enough to cause inertial effects. Right. Um, let's go ahead and click on this red hot spot, right click on it, and again graph these values. What you can do at this point, you notice this graph, see how we're looking at factor of safety and how at the top here, or at the front end of the graph, it's a very high value, right? right? When we the load have, hasn't been applied yet. Exactly. When we haven't applied that dynamic load yet, the, the factor of safety is going to be huge. Now, what we can do to kind of isolate this is we can change our axis control 
but an easier way to do it is just kind of box in on the graph the area that we care about, right? So we'll kind of box in this first peak and we'll take a look at what we have. Nice, that's a totally pro tip. We can also right click and display the data labels so we can see exactly at what time and what the factor of safety is. And again, going back to our time step discussion, we can see that this looks pretty, the curves look pretty smooth and we're pretty much capturing all the response. Right. It does peak out and go down in a very periodic nature. Right. So check this out. I want to measure from peak to peak. Okay. Right? That's the period of the peak in seconds. Invert that, which gives me frequency in hertz, one over seconds. And this actually corresponds exactly to what we would call the first natural frequency of this frame system. Interesting. Now, speaking of natural frequencies, I mean, what really are they and why are they that important to us when we're designing? Right. Well, let's go back to the cantilevered structural tube example. We can solve this real quickly with a modal analysis and see that the first mode is a simple cantilevered up and down. And if we measure that frequency versus what we got on tape here at the physical results, we see it's pretty much the same thing. So our response is almost always a combination of our first, second, third, however many natural frequencies there are, it kind of combines together. So what we can do with simulation is solve for what those natural frequencies are in our system. That sounds like something we should take a look at in a future episode. Absolutely. So everyone, thanks a lot for joining us. Remember, simulate early, simulate often. I'm Brian. I'm Dave May. See you later.